So I want to move on to Savile, which is a film that you made earlier this year, which um, which I know was something when you know when we first started working together was a film that you wanted to to make. Um, do you um, do you want to say a bit about why it was that you decided? You know, and in terms of this sort of unity in your career that that you've been so eloquently sort of describing, do you want to be able? Do you want to say why it was that it was so important for you to go back to to the Savile subject? Uh, I don't know how thought through it was in, in one level. I was just aware that uh, I had had this r rather bizarre situation in which a, a profile that I'd made of an eccentric aging celebrity who appeared to have secrets, but undefined um, secrets, had become uh, the most in-depth TV portrait of Britain's most notorious sex offender, you know, um, 15 years, I suppose, after I'd made it. And uh, the alchemy or the strange act of um, transformation by which that took place, uh, I thought was, you know, represented a, a huge shift in, in both ha how we understand um, sexual assault, our, our ability to hear the voices of, of victims, and and if you know in a small way i suppose i felt that um i had to take account of myself and and how it was that i had not managed to show more of him and you know i i'm on i'm very much sort of on the horns of a kind of I, I i'm very torn on this because on one level i'm really proud of the original show and i feel it showed more than anyone else had while he, he was alive. On another level, I'm aware that we missed this vast secret that he had. Um, and a little part of me feels disappointed with myself that, you know, that he, was, he, he agreed to do this documentary with me. At some level, he must have known that he had these secrets and that he saw me, he sized me up and thought, you know what, I can give this guy two weeks or three weeks of access and make a documentary about me, and I'm not too worried that he's going to uncover the fact that I'm a um, sexual predator. And, um, you know, in a sense, in that calculation, he, he was correct, which is, which is, you know, rather galling. But uh, by going back, I thought I could, you know, I, you know, this may sound really pompous, but you know, I do. I I read a lot in Holocaust literature. Um, authors like uh, Primo Levi, um, Gita Sereni, attempts to understand the, the worst crimes. Uh, you know, in the in the annals of of humanity. And and what's always struck me is that they're, they're most powerfully told when they're told in the most sort of nuanced and unemotional and matter of fact way. You know, th for me, that's Primo Levi's great gift as a writer, was his ability to see uh, all the complexity, the moral complexity of, of the nature of suffering and evil. You know, the way in which suffering doesn't actually ennoble its victims. In, in many ways, it's a, it's a corrupting process by which those people who are um, who abused and misused become dragged down into the iniquity. And by the same token, in a small, in a tiny way, I hoped that you know that this this sort of national crime that's taken place would lend itself to a treatment that was just very very um, matter of fact that didn't over emotionalize it. There was an attempt to understand in an honest way how we were all and myself in particular um, taken for a ride, taken in, gulled by this um, by this character. 